and the different um, areas of the ear. This is uh, tragus, the external artery canal. This is the ear lobule. This is the concha, helix, and antihelix. Uh, the pathologies of uh, external artery canal can be uh, the pathologies can be divided into three main headings: the congenital conditions, inflammatory conditions, and trauma. Uh, there are some more, but uh, we will stick our topic to the first two, and if there's time, we'll discuss the third one. Congenital conditions, uh, one of them is uh, microtia. That is a developmental anatomy uh, anomaly of the pinna and external artery canal. Uh, there are four grades of microtia depending upon the uh, severity of the condition. Grade one is abnormal oracle with all identifiable landmarks. Like this one, in which there is a slight anomaly here in the helix. Uh, but all the other landmarks are identifiable, like tragus, antitragus, lobule. This is grade one. As the anomaly increases, the grading has the grading increases. Uh, grade two is abnormal oracle with some landmarks. Grade three is very small auricular tag, like this one, where only a tag of auricle is seen. And grade four is anosia, means complete absence of the external ear. So this is grade one, grade two, and grade three. Uh, I think, okay, I don't have a picture of grade four. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are pictures of uh, different grades of microtia. Another picture of grade one anomaly. Uh, these present at various stages of um, in their usually in the childhood uh, and obviously the most uh, common complaint is um, the cosmetic and deformity that these children have in their assessment we have to uh, we have to assess the not only the external appearance, uh, but also assess the hearing. Because uh, along with this external appearance, there may be developmental anomaly of the middle ear or inner ear as well. Um, clinical examination will make um, clear in many of these conditions where the external auditory canal is present or not. And if the tympanic membrane is visible or not. If external auditory canal is uh, normal, tympanic membrane is normal, uh, and hearing assessment is normal, um, the only treatment that they might need um, is a uh, some sort of uh, correction of these anomaly um, surgically. Uh, 
in cases of higher grades, uh, the external artery canal may be abnormal or completely absent. Uh, in these cases, um, we may have to, um, of course, after, after we have done a clinical examination and assess the hearing uh, of the patient, we may have to do a CT scan to see the development of middle ear and inner ear. Uh, treatment in mean, all these cases will um, depend on the degree of uh, anomaly and the, cos or the, or the cosmetic deformity and the hearing presence or absence of hearing loss. As far as the um, uh, cosmetic appearance is uh, concerned, some sort of surgical procedure uh, can be done to correct these deformities. Um, like if there is a small nodule that can be removed, but uh, any degree of um, increasing uh, grade of microtia requires a surgical reconstruction with uh, either silastic implants can be used or reconstruction with autogenous cartilage, which can be harvested from uh, the ribs, most commonly from the ribs. Our future development might involve tissue engineering and okay. Uh, the another condition is preauricular sinus. Uh, this is a condition in which uh, in front of the helix there is. Uh, there is a small depression visible, as you can see here. In front of the mm, helix, and that is called a preauricular sinus. Uh, this is also because of the developmental failure of the um, arches. And this is diagnosed by um, presence of a small depression in front of the uh, helix. Quite often, this is not pointed out until uh, some complication uh, develops, like an infection in this uh, in the sinus. Uh, and before that, uh, there may be a history of discharge, whitish, creamy discharge from the uh, keratin that may have collected in the sinus. So the presentation could be just a depression or as you can see here, there is a little bit of inflammation here around the sinus. There can be a small cyst or skin tags or fleshy knobs of the skin in front of the ear, like these uh, small skin tags in front of the ear, the, their importance is only cosmetic and they are not usually not associated with in any other anomalies or any degree of hearing loss. Treatment of uh, these uh, depends, uh, the preauricular sinus depends on the um, presentation. In cases of uninfected sinus, um, the surgery um, is the treatment, uh, and that involves complete removal of the sinus um, along with any tract that may be present. 
um, and, and it's a small surgical procedure which can be done. Um, usually in children has to be done under general anesthesia and uh, a small uh, incision is given around the sinus and uh, the whole tract uh, needs to be removed. It's important that the whole tract is removed. Mm, otherwise, uh, if any uh, the rest of the sinus uh, mm, cavity wall is uh, left behind, uh, there is chance of recurrence. In case there is uh, mm, infection of the sinus, cavity um, usually requires treatment with uh, antibiotics to resolve the infection. Sometimes there is an abscess formation. In that case, the abscess may need to be drained uh, first. And once these infection or abscesses have uh, been treated, uh, the wound and the wound has healed, usually um, after six to eight weeks, then the sinus cavity can be, the pre-auricular sinus can be removed by a surgical procedure. If there are any skin tags as uh, visible here, they can be removed surgically. Uh, inflammatory conditions, um, there are many inflammatory conditions and depending upon the cause, uh, there are certain immunologic disorders um, uh, which causes inflammation in the ear, um, atopic dermatitis, uh, allergic contact dermatitis, uh, psoriasis and relapsing polychondritis are some of the conditions. There are a few more, but we have uh, I've just listed four. Mm, these are usually inflammatory conditions, atopic dermatitis, allergic contact dermatitis, where a patient may have allergy to usually mm, to mm, uh, artificial jewelry uh, or to other chemicals, uh, and they present with uh, scaling and inflammation of the skin. Uh, psoriasis, uh, mm, as, as you know, is an inflammatory condition of the skin, which can affect the different parts of the body. And uh, so the ear canal, uh, so the auricle can be affected as well. A relapsing polychondritis is the condition where there is recurrent inflammation of the cartilage um, during ear areas uh, of the skin. Uh, and other parts of the body as well. So um, as spina can be affected sometimes the um, nose and uh, other areas where cartilage is uh, present, uh, such as thyroid cartilage, they can be um, involved as well. Traumatic conditions, um, irritant dermatitis, radiodermatitis, where um, a person who has been exposed to radiation um, can, can give rise to acute or chronic cases of uh, dermatitis. Uh, traumatic stenosis of external auditory canal usually result from trauma to the external ear. Clinically, they can present as a narrowing of the auditory canal, um, and that results in collection of debris beyond the obstruction. So the obstruction in the proximal part of the external auditory canal, um, the debris from the ear canal, which normally it comes out, gets collected behind the obstruction and can give rise to blockage, resulting in deafness. There can be pain. Sometimes there can be pain. 
and the treatment uh, usually involves uh, meticulous treatment, uh, uh, repeated oral toilet uh, under the microscope. In severe conditions where there is um, very tight stenosis or where uh, the patient has to get the cleaning done repeatedly, um, uh, the condition may need to be treated surgically um, where the opening of the canal is widened surgically. Otitis externa. This can be broadly classified into bacterial and fungal. Another classification would be acute and chronic. Uh, bacterial otitis externa, uh, the most common organisms are uh, Staphylococcus aureus and Pseudomonas. Acute otitis externa can present as a, as a boil, as in this case, the picture on the left shows a small boil, and the picture in the middle shows a generalized otitis externa. In acute cases, uh, usually the presentation is um, a sudden onset or a short period of history uh, of pain in the um, ear. Um, uh, the pain could be quite severe. And along with that, there can be some discharge. Uh, there may be fever. And on examination, uh, you will usually say, uh, see in cases of boil, um, the outer part of the ear um, is uh, extremely tender and the uh, boil may be visible. Uh, on the other hand, in cases of generalized neurotitis externa, uh, the mm, pinna is uh, pinna or tragus is tender on palpation. There is uh, varying degrees of um, edema and crusting in the canal. And, and clinical examination uh, is supplemented by um, the treatment that is given is uh, in cases of boil, usually a course of antibiotic, which uh, is sensitive to uh, Staph aureus, along with painkillers is uh, usually sufficient. Um, oral toilet to Clean the debris from the canal uh, is helpful. And in cases of generalized otitis externa, a course of antibiotics um, along with uh, painkillers is required. Uh, the two pictures on the right side, you can see in the bottom one, um, these are. Uh, um, inflammation due to fungal infection. And usually uh, the infection is by candida albicans and aspergillosis or aspergillus nigra. This picture is showing um, on the top one is fungal otitis because of aspergillus niger, uh, where you see typical brown blackish brown um, fungi here and in the bottom one is because of uh, the candida otitis externa because of the candida albicum. Uh, presentation here is usually uh, 
same as in otitis externa, uh, but uh, the, the presentation may be less acute. Uh, they complain of pain, blockage of ear, uh, sometimes discharge from the ear. Uh, and uh, one, one uh, predominant symptom usually is uh, intense itching. And the course could be um, quite prolonged. Uh, treatment uh, involves oral toilet, um, which means the cleaning of ear canal. Um, usually we do that in clinic under the microscope, um, along with uh, uh, topical antifungal and the uh, drops. These topical antifungal drops needs to be used for at least two to three weeks. If the treatment is uh, stopped prematurely, um, the infection, there can be quite often uh, recurrence of the infection. Uh, so, just to recall uh, clinical features uh, in uh, bacterial otitis externa, um, pain, blockage of the ear, uh, examination on examination, pinna is tender, um, there could be discharge present in the ear, and uh, patient may have fever. And the treatment involves oral toilet. That is quite, uh, this is quite uh, important step. Um, if there is any discharge or debris in the canal, um, the, uh, th that needs to be cleaned uh, with suction. Uh, systemic or topical antibiotic. Uh, uh, analgesia and anti-inflammatory drugs needs to be given. Uh, fungal otitis externa, um, clinical features, again, um, pain, blockage of the ear, Mm, discharge from the ear, uh, but as I said, one uh, predominant symptom is intense itching. Treatment involves oral toilet, uh, which means uh, cleaning the ear, um, usually mm, with the help of head light or under the microscope and suction. Antifungal uh, cream or drops um needs to be used here and analgesics and anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, malignant hepatitis externa. Uh, this is an important uh, condition. Uh, uh, the name suggests malignant otitis externa, but um, it's not a, a tumor, but it's an inflammatory condition which um, has its pathology in infection in the external auditory canal and temporal bone, uh, usually caused by pseudomonas um, aeruginosa. Um, and the predominant uh, overlying underly underlying condition is mostly in cases of uh, patients who have immunodeficiency. So a lot of uh, these patients are elderly diabetics. Uh, some of them have um, other uh, have been on um, chemotherapy or other cases, causes of 
immune, uh, which suppresses their immunity. But mostly we see in diabetic, elderly diabetic, and there is progressive uh, osteomyelitis of the temporal bone, uh, which uh, as it progresses, it can involve um, cranial nerves and sometimes can progress to intracranial involvement as well. Here's a picture of a patient with left-sided facial palsy. Uh, see their left eye is not closing completely. The angle of mouth is deviating to the other side. And he has a malignant otitis externa of the left ear. Uh, Clinical presentation is um, diabetic. Usually, as I said, usually these are diabetics um, or they have immunosuppression from other causes. One of the predominant features is a severe pain in the ear, extremely painful condition. Uh, they are very much debilitated by severe pain. Um, there can be ear discharge and cranial nerve involvement, depending upon the which cranial nerves are involved, they may present with facial paralysis or involvement of uh, other upper cranial nerves, such as ninth, tenth, ninth nerve, tenth nerve. And depending upon this, um, there may be um, difficulty in swallowing, change of voice. Uh, some of these patients are quite severely ill from their other systemic um, diseases. On examination, uh, there is uh, tenderness present. Uh, one of the, um, the, the characteristic features is present of granulation tissue at the floor of the external artery canal. Tympanic membrane is usually intact, um, and sometimes fever can be present. Uh, diagnostic um, workup, uh, WBC, white cell count is usually normal. Uh, ESR may be raised. Um, culture and sensitivity test of the person uh, should always be done and blood sugar should be checked. And culture, usually uh, we get pseudomonas in culture, but sometimes staph aureus is also isolated. Uh, treatment, uh, if um, they're diabetic, their um, control of sugar, good control of sugar. Yeah, usually their um, control of blood sugar is also uh, not very good. And we see very high level of uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, so the diabetes needs to be controlled. Oral toilet, uh, systemic antibiotic according to culture and sensitivity. Uh, usually, ciprofloxacin um, is, is used, and uh, this systemic antibiotic usually is given in um, parenteral form. So, the, the IV intravenous injections of uh, ciprofloxacin or others, other antibiotics uh, to which um, the organisms are sensitive. And this needs to be given for a prolonged period of time. So um, four to six weeks of intravenous antibiotic needs to be given in cases of malignant otitis externa. Uh, topical antibiotic uh, in the form of drops can be given. Usually they respond well to treatment provided 
uh, the primary condition uh, of their immunosuppression is also controlled uh, well. So the blood sugar needs to be controlled um, controlled well, and the antibiotic needs to be given for a long period of time, and the um, patients. Uh, the, the, how we judge whether treatment is working or not is the decrease in the severity of the pain. Sometimes patients who present in advanced disease, advanced stages of the disease where the skull base is involved and multiple pain nerves are involved, may need surgical debridement. Uh, prognosis uh, is guarded. Uh, mortality uh, can be um, in up to 15% of cases, but with effective treatment that has been reduced. Um, the recurrence could be, there could be high rates of recurrence and that can happen rate, uh, late as well. So the patient may respond partially to the treatment uh, and the recurrence can happen after once the treatment has been done. Trauma, auricular trauma, the blunt trauma to the auricle, uh, usually in contact sports or um, accidents uh, can give rise to trauma to the external. Um, Ear or to the kinna or ear. Um, this can result in laceration, uh, bleeding from the pinna. There could be organized hematoma, granulation formation, uh, resulting in resorption of cartilage and resulting deformity uh, and cauliflower ear. Here there's a blunt trauma to the um, pinna in the region of the um, helix, resulting in some degree of swelling and bruising. Another picture showing um, hematoma formation under the skin, secondary to blunt trauma. Uh, management depends on the type of injury. Mm, if there is uh, mm, hematoma formation, uh, that can be mm, removed uh, with uh, needle aspiration, or it may require, if it's large, may require incision and draining. Uh, the goal of treatment is to remove the blood clot or fluid that has built up between the cartilage and pericondrium. And then the skin and the pericon and the cartilage are opposed with tight dressing so that there is uh, it prevents the recollection of the fluid. This is a picture showing uh, hematoma formation um, and which has been tried to be drained here with a small incision. Uh, another picture showing a large um, hematoma, secondary to blunt trauma. And this has caused this um, change in shape of the pinna and bulging of the skin. And uh, there is collection of blood under the skin. This can be, this is the mm, incision that can be given for drainage of hematoma. Uh, the blood and any fluid that is collected between the skin and the cartilage is um, removed with suction or curettage. A tight dressing is applied. 
so that the skin is approximated with the cartilage and dressing is applied and left in place for about a week so that uh, the skin adheres to the underlying cartilage. In cases of repeated trauma or if the uh, blood is not, uh, hematoma is not drained properly, that can result in resorption of the cartilage and a deformity develops on the pinna, which is called cauliflower ear. This can be a common thing in cases of uh, boxers who suffer repeated trauma if they are exposed to that when they involve in fight uh, without proper protective headgear. A cauliflower ear is a permanent deformity. His surgery is the only choice to restore the normal shape, but it's challenging and not that rewarding. Outcomes are guarded. <laughs>